Testing. 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 You have the chime, Barb? 
720. Okay.
Okay, let's get underway. Welcome, everyone. Welcome this evening. Let me get our, our announcement slide up so we can get underway. <coughs> okay, some announcements on the upcoming weeks. Next week will be our November 3rd black and white print competition. And since it's a print competition, and we need about 20, 30 minutes for the judges to, we have to occupy you while the judges are judging the prints. And we're getting low on uh, speakers for this little time too. So I got hauled out again. I will give you my song and dance on November 3rd. I'm gonna give a 30 minute talk on the monitor calibration, how and why. That'll be the pre-print competition talk. And we'll go over just the, just the theory of why the heck should you even bother calorie? You know, what is, does it make any difference? You know, how do I do it? You know, how does that affect my prints? That type of thing. Just some basic kind of stuff to give you an idea. So uh, we'll be talking about that uh, just before the competition next week, November 3rd. November 10th is another B competition, which will be projection. That's for our beginners. And November 17th will be a creative competition, um, which should be interesting uh, because this is the first creative competition under the new rules with AI, meaning AI, where you actually generate things in the image, will be allowed in, the, in this competition. So it'll be interesting to see what we get uh, as well. By the way, the rules for the new rules for competition, including AI and whatnot too, are on our website under the competition area and just go to the little button that says rules and they'll have all of that. And November 24th, Thanksgiving, Clubhouse will be closed because we will all still be sitting with lots of turkey in us won't be able to move or push the button to play. Um, <laughs> SIG meeting, November 2nd. Now, two things are gonna happen here. Dave Bush is bringing in a huge collection of camera <coughs> equipment that he's got to sell. He'll be here at 6 p.m. if anyone wanted to come in early just to look at the stuff. Dave writes all the books on photography. He's real big on Amazon. He's wrote a lot of these uh, real definitive books on the different cameras. So he uses these cameras for a short bit to do the book, and then he sells them, very low shutter counts as well. So he'll have a bunch of them there, and his talk is gonna be on HDR. Uh, HDR, not just regular, but using the in-camera HDR um, tools that a lot of the modern cameras have, as well as HDR uh, advanced manual techniques with software too. So he's gonna be going over all things HDR, and then afterwards we'll be just talking cameras. Upcoming items of interest, Pixel Connection is having its winter demo day November 18th. They have a lot of special things just for our club, special things for our club members. <laughs> There'll be free sensor cleaning, uh, one free sensor cleaning, gift cards for the first 50 members, hourly giveaway drawings, several classes around the event. What I don't have on this slide too is to uh, sign up for this and get your special discounts and offers for being a CPS member. Just go to our website, sign into our website with your credentials, go to the members only section and you will see that and you'll be able to uh, get the Pixel Connection um, uh, items. And a new thing I'm instituting today, up here in front, the people at home, I am sorry, uh, you can't get to it right now, but we have our CPS free table. You know, my saying is, as I was telling the audience before, is I think our saying will be, let our clutter become your clutter. Uh, as well. I mean, there are books by Dave Bush here, brand new, that were just sitting in a corner, lots of them. There is a carousel projector, working or not working, I don't even know, but all the parts are there. There is a Polaroid camera, which I think is working, as well as assorted lenses and other things too. 
This is just stuff that we're found sitting in corners. We are giving it away. The table will just stay up. If you see anything you like, just pocket it and take it home. So that is our free table. Um, new policy, returning new CPS returning student policy. In the past, we've had it that if you're a member of our school, you're a student for life. Uh, we are uh, changing that now. Uh, the board is changing this to a uh, $10 fee for any returning students to any of the CPS schools. So if, you're, if you've taken a class and you want to repeat, you know, repeat that class, repeat a, 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 an individual class, the whole course or whatnot, it's just a single $10 fee. And that's to help cover rising costs in both technology and administration um, as well. We still feel that's an excellent value. You know, ten dollars. That's it. You could you get the whole new videos. You get the new uh, course downloads. Everything else like that. So that is uh, you will find that if you are signing up as a returning student. We plan to put that into effect uh, December first. And of course, our schools. Fundamentals, good photography, intro to Photoshop, photo editing, Lightroom Classic, and intermediate Photoshop, photo editing are all coming up. Great values for the money. They are all in person and virtual uh, as well. You could find out more about them and sign up on our website, just under the school section, to find out more about them. And it is not too early to save the date. Cabin Fever Party, which we started last year after COVID, and it was a tremendous success. Food, prizes, robber's auction, Lots of fun, annual tradition. We hold it right here. We move out all the chairs, have tables. It's like a potluck thing, and it is really a lot of fun. Hold the date, January 27th, 2024. This way there is no excuses when you tell me, oh, I, I, I had something else scheduled. So <laughs> we're the first in. The light painting workshop that we had last week where we had Jeff Leinbach in doing it actual hands-on demonstration here. Before his hands-on demonstration, and it was really, really well attended, he gave a 35, 40 minute talk on it as well. And what I did is I recorded that talk and I put it up on the website. So you'll find that on, the, just sign into the CPS website with your credentials, go to the members only area where we have all of our videos and Zooms and things, and you'll find that right there. And of course, all of our public meetings are all on our YouTube channel. And to get there, you just go to our website. And in the upper right, there is a YouTube icon. Just click on that. When you get to the YouTube page, click on Live. And then you will see all of the CPS lectures and talks in order. So without any further ado, we will get to the main attraction tonight. We are lucky enough to have uh, one of our own members, uh, Ken Hubble, who is going to talk and give us enough time to get our equipment set for next April's uh, solar eclipse. And he's going to talk on that tonight. So, Ken, I, I'll get your... Turn it over. Your phone. That's okay. <laughs> Just, we'll get you all hooked up sound-wise. We'll take care okay. of that. Let me just... Let me just start to get things set here. Okay. And then we'll we'll check your your sound thing. Just click on. Okay. Got it there. There we go. Maybe we can we gotta do a test on the sound. Testing one, two, three. Yep, yep. we got you. Okay. That's the clear. There you go. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Ken Hubble, and as Richard said, I'm gonna be talking about uh, photographing the solar eclipse that's coming up. Uh, April 8th of 2024, uh, about six months from now, maybe a little more than six months from now. And I'm going to share with you some of my experiences that I encountered when I photographed my first eclipse back in August 2017. The last one that was visible from this area in Cleveland here, it was a partial eclipse. The one that's going to be occurring uh, in April of next year is going to be a total solar eclipse as seen from, from, this, from this area. will be one of the few areas on about a 200 mile wide swath path that runs from uh, roughly Texas all the way up to New England uh, to be able to see this. And basically what is a total solar eclipse? It's basically when the moon 
and the sun are positioned at such a point where the moon projects a shadow of itself on the earth and essentially what you're, what is, what you're seeing is you're seeing the moon blot out the sun. They happen very rarely, it's a rare occurrence. Uh, like I said, the last time it happened here was back in August of 2017, but that was a partial eclipse. In order for to, to see a full eclipse, you had to go point southwest of here, like in the Illinois, in areas, in areas like that. So Arkansas, places like that. So that's basically what a solar eclipse is. And this is the path that we're going to see. You see it's going to start here in the Pacific just off the coast of Mexico. It's going to go through Mexico. It's going to go through Texas, Arkansas, Missouri, a uh, little corner of Kentucky and Illinois. St. Louis is not quite on there on the center line, but as you can see Cleveland is right there. And for us, it'll start first contact, which is when the moon makes first contact with the sun, will be at 1.59 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. When you're looking up at the sun, you'll see a little chunk taken out. That's the moon, that's the eclipse beginning. Okay, totality begins at 3.13 p.m. That's when the moon is completely over the sun and the sun is blotted out and all you see is the corona of the sun, which is the outer atmosphere of the sun. And uh, the maximum eclipse, which will be for uh, about halfway between uh, the mid-wave totality will be at about 3.15 p.m. I think totality is going to last something like about four minutes. So this is going to be a rather long eclipse. So you'll have plenty of opportunities to get your cameras ready and have your cameras up there and ready to photograph it. And you'll have a nice long window. Uh, I think it goes a little over four minutes actually. I'm not, I, I couldn't get exact figures on the internet. I heard four minutes, I heard somebody said four and a half minutes. So I'm just going to go with four minutes. Basically all you really need is, is your camera and a sturdy tripod and this silver thing here that says Thousand Oaks Optical on the end of it, that's a full aperture solar filter. That goes over your camera, your camera lens, and what that does is that makes it safe for you to point the camera at the sun without ruining your sensor or ruining your eyesight. Okay, You never want to point your camera at the sun without a solar filter on the end of it. And that's just one type of solar filter. They do make solar filters, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on in the presentation, that thread onto your camera lens like a filter would, like a UV filter or a neutral density filter or what have you. Uh, and they, those are available as well. However, I don't really recommend those. I re recommend this type instead. This is a slip fit filter. You just slip it on and slip it off because you're going to want to uh, have uh, you're going to want to have uh, some lead, lead time uh, between when the partial phases happen and when totality happens because during totality you're going to take the filter off and you're going to photograph without the filter while the sun is totally eclipsed and you want to be able to just slip it back on again and not have to sit there and futz with threading and all this other stuff I mean you can do that it's, it's possible you can thread it on partially and and still, and still have enough lead time to, to uh, remove, it, remove it in time. This is a typical, which you'll see typical image of the sun through a solar filter. This is through a Thousand Oaks solar filter. And this was taken approximately with a, uh, I think a 300 millimeter lens. That's about the size image you will get if you're using a 300 millimeter lens. Uh, as you can see, there are sunspots that are visible. Those are not dust particles on the sensor. Those are actual sunspots, which are magnetic areas of mag magnetism on the surface of the sun. You're seeing the actual visible surface of the sun, the photosphere. And that's what the filter will reveal. 
And to prepare in advance, uh, I would highly recommend freshly and fully charged batteries. Uh, the reason why I say that, and it's obvious, but it's not obvious because my wife and I, Barb, Barb and I, went out on a photo shoot back uh, earlier this spring to photograph some bir wild birds. And we checked her batteries before we left the house, and they indicated they were, the camera indicated they were fully charged. However, when we got out to actually photograph, we took a couple of photographs, and before we knew it, we were down to one bar, and then the autofocus was dead, and then the battery died. So you want to make sure those batteries are freshly charged. The batteries had sat for about a month or two prior to being used. So you want to make sure you charge your batteries up the night before the eclipse so they're freshly charged. Very important to remember that. Uh, extra memory cards if you need them. Of course, a tripod. Uh, you want to make sure it's a reasonably good solid tripod, steady, st sturdy tripod. Uh, shutter release because you don't want to touch the camera while you're photographing. You want to have a remote shutter release, either wireless or wired. For our particular camera, we have a wired remote. And your solar filter for your camera, and you want to make sure you use an ISO approved 12312-2 certified solar filter. This is important because, and it'll say on the various uh, sites that I'm gonna, uh, websites that I'm gonna show at the end of the slides, uh, where you can obtain those filters from and these are all very reputable companies and these are safe solar filters Which means you will not be putting your vision at risk by using them or your, or your camera for that matter uh, Eclipse viewing glasses These things right here. I've got three pairs. I'm going to give away if anybody wants them. They're sitting here on the chair Basically, you put them, you wear them like 3D glasses, you know, like eyeglasses, and they will allow you to look up at the sun and follow the, and follow the event as it's going on. And of course, make sure your camera and your sensor and your lens are clean. Uh, you don't want to have any dust particles on your lens or camera sensor. Okay, what kind of filter? A proper and safe solar filter or neutral density filter of 16 stops or higher will, will, do, will, will do the job. When I say a neutral density filter of 16 stops or higher, you can get those at any of the, like B&H Photo or Adorama or probably your local camera store will have them or they can order them for you. But it can't be anything lower than 16 stops. It will let in too much light and not block out enough light and that could damage your camera sensor and consequently your vision. And if you're looking for a, if you're gonna go with a neutral density filter, they just thread on like any other camera filter would. And if you can find the filter size on, of your lens, it's indicated on the side on the, or on the front of your lens as a zero with a line through it and a number next to it. So if you have a 67 millimeter filter, you'll have a zero with the line through it and it says 67 afterward, or 77 or 58 or whatever, whatever filter size your, your lens happens to use. And importantly, you never want to use a photographic neutral density filter for direct solar viewing. Very dangerous. They're not made for that. Don't do it. It's not worth risking your eyesight. Use the eclipse glasses if you're, doing, if you're going to do direct solar viewing. You'll be taking them on and putting them off constantly, probably, if, between when you're looking at the sun and looking at your camera, but it's, it could be a pain in the butt. I know because I, I had to do it for the last eclipse. and It became, it, it got old real quick, but the thing is you don't want to play games with your eyesight. So, and if you're going to, if you're going to use a neutral density filter, of 16 stops or higher. You uh, don't want to view with the optical viewfinder. You want to use live view through your camera instead, if your camera has it. And most cameras, I think, nowadays do have that. Your lens should be at least 200 millimeters focal length. Uh, 400 millimeters to 800 millimeters maximum 
You don't want to go above 800 millimeters because then you're getting into telescope territory. And uh, if you get above if you get above 800 millimeters, what's going to happen is you're not going to get the whole solar disk in the corona. You'll get the eclipse itself, but you won't get the corona surrounding the sun in the field of view because you're going to have too much magnification. So 400 millimeters, 800 millimeters maximum. 600 millimeters is about the middle ideal ground for getting a well balanced a well balanced shot. Uh, you can use a teleconverter. 1.4 times, 1.5 times, or 2 times with a 70 to 200 millimeter or 300 millimeter lens. Uh, but you've got to keep in mind you're going to lose a couple of stops of light. Uh, I have used teleconverters extensively, and once you get to once you get to use them, it's like it's like they're not even there. I mean, I I wouldn't go personally. I would not go more than 1.5 times or 1.7 times. Because when you start getting into two times teleconverters, or, and sometimes uh, there are even some people that make a three times teleconverter, <laughs> then you're throwing away too much light, and you've got to stop that. Your 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 camera's going to stop down to some, like something like f f11 or f16 or something like that. And uh, I don't think I'd go with a two times teleconverter. If you have one, you can use it and see what happens. But I'd stick with something in the 1.4 to 1.7 times range. Uh, you can also consider purchasing or renting a long lens. And at the after the presentation, I will have a couple of uh, places where you can obtain rental, uh, where you can rent lenses from. Uh, again, you don't have to have a big, huge honking lens on the end of your camera, on the front of your camera, to be able to photograph this event. It's not mandatory. So if you don't have a big lens, you don't have to go run out and buy one. Uh, so you can consider purchasing or renting a long lens. It should be a large enough of the image of the solar disk and corona without cutting anything off. So you want to have some black space around the entire image. Here's an example of a solar disk shot taken with a 200 millimeter lens. And you can see that it's still, you know, it's still large enough you can you can barely I don't know if you can see them in the audience here but you can make out a couple some sunspots here uh, but remember you're not photographing sunspots specifically you're photographing an eclipse so a 200 millimeter lens is often typically the minimum you'd want to use to photograph this photograph this eclipse with Uh, for preparation, you want to arrive at your site, wherever you're going to go, um, and set up early, and just sit back and wait for the event to happen. Uh, you don't want to be in, a, be in a rush because then you overlook things, and then you never know, you might forget a memory card. Is, you need to put a memory card in your camera or something like that, or a battery or something like that. You go to photograph and nothing happens. So you want to arrive and set up early. Make sure your tripod is nice and level. Most tripods have a little built-in bubble level on them. Put your solar filter in place. And very importantly, make sure your vibration reduction and image stabilization is turned off. You're going to be on a tripod. You're not going to need it. It won't be necessary. You want to set your camera to aperture priority and you want to use a fixed ISO which is determined in advance by taking some test shots of the sun. Now a lot of that's going to depend on what your ISO is going to depend on and I've, I've typically used between 100 and 400 for the partial phases of the eclipse. Now if we have sky conditions that day that are, have uh, say cumulus clouds and a cumulus cloud, cloud happens to come by and park itself over the partially eclipsed sun then you may have to increase your ISO a little bit, okay, or your or your shutter speed or whatnot. Uh, that's what happened during the 2017 eclipse, and in my slides that I'm going to show of that eclipse, you'll see where some of the pictures were actually under and overexposed because we had broken we had we had cumulus cloud broken cumulus clouds that day. If possible, shoot in raw format. And you want to choose spot metering. 
you're only going to be focusing on the sun and that's what you're going to that's going to be a small relatively small image a small part of the sky uh, I take some test shots uh, of the solar disk to compose the shot using the camera screen uh, I recommend bracketing exposures and use auto bracketing if you have it available on your camera and very importantly exposure compensation uh, that's a very important thing to remember because uh, again if a cloud comes and parks itself over the sun it's going to dim the sun to the point where you may have to over or under expose depending upon the, nat the nature of the cloud or what have you or you know whatever whatever the weather is doing that day provided we even see this thing here from Cleveland and here's an example of three solar image solar disk images on the left you have two stops of exposure evenly exposed and then plus two stops of exposure so this is what I would recommend doing uh, until you get an image that ideally looks like this this is a properly exposed solar disk image kind of looks like a big orange um, you want to stop down incrementally and slightly from the widest aperture for your sharpest image most camera lenses work well when you stop them down by a stop or two that's when they're when that's when they start working really well and that'll give you your sharpest possible solar disk image uh, if you feel you need to stop down more then by all means do so but adjust your shutter speed and your ISO accordingly uh, f5.6 to f8 is what I have found during the last eclipse to be best for the particular camera that I was using at the time which at that time was a Nikon bridge camera it wasn't even an SLR I think it was a Nikon P6, Coolpix P6, P600 or P610 or something like that you know where you had the you can zoom the lens you can you press the lever and the lens it, had, it was a fixed lens that zoom in and out uh, find your best focus using manual focus for most of us that's going to probably be infinity uh, and you'll want to use a base exposure of about one one hundredth to one five hundredth of a second again a lot of that's going to depend on the sky conditions if there's going to be scattered clouds around th that one could park itself over the sun and you may have to increase or you know you may have to increase your shutter speed a little bit in order to get a properly exposed image but that's where the exposure compensation comes in for partial phases I recommend using ISO 100 to 400 and again use exposure bracketing and compensation as totality approaches you want to increase your ISO because the sunlight the available sunlight is going to get very it's going to get very dim okay and you'll want to increase your ISO maybe to 640 or 800 I don't think I'd go much either I don't think I went much higher than 800 on the last one because I didn't really need to because it was only a partial eclipse but this is going to be a total eclipse so this is going to be different this will be my first total eclipse in my life that I've seen so I'm kind of shooting off the cuff here a little bit when it comes to and hedging a little bit when it comes to how much you want to increase your ISO for totality you want to low uh, you want to use a lower ISO and you want to take your filter off the camera and you'll want to remove your protective glasses you won't need them the sun will be completely blocked out so you won't be staring up at the at a, at a completely full sun uh, exposure bracketing for totality as well because you want to make sure you get the corona of the sun properly exposed you want don't want it too bright and you don't want it too dim you want it to be you want it to be perfectly exposed and for egress which is what the moon after totality when the moon moves away from the sun and starts to re the sun starts to reemerge again 
you'll want to repeat the whole process again with the filter in place and with your eclipse glasses back on. Now this, this particular image, this was taken of the sun using the Bader Astro Solar Safety Film. As you can see, it gives a whitish, kind of a whitish, almost kind of like a little, little tint of blue, purple maybe, I don't know. In any case, this is what you'll see when you photograph the sun, full, a fully uh, exposed sun. And again, you can pick up, you can see there are obvious sunspot groups there. And that's all you're going to see now. There are, there are some telescopes and filters on the market that have come about in recent years called hydrogen alpha filters. Now they are a very expensive alternative to white light filters. This is a white light filter, what's referred to as a white light filter. Okay, hydrogen alpha actually photograph is actually exp you actually can see the sun at a certain wavelength, which happens to be 656 nanometers, which is the hydrogen alpha line in the in the uh, spectrum. And what that reveals is that reveals the prominences on the side of the sun, those flame-like structures that, you, that you've seen pictures of in NASA photographs and whatnot. Those are nice, those are spectacular. So if you have one of those, consider yourself lucky. I've had them in the past. Uh, I've been very fortunate to use them. I've never had one during a solar eclipse. I don't really go out, I'm not a sun worshiper anymore. So I don't have any more of those. But uh, if you have one, feel free to use it because you'll get some spectacular eclipse pictures of the sun photographed in, in hydrogen alpha. But white light is all you really need. You don't need to go out and spend thousands of dollars on a hydrogen alpha uh, telescope or filter to get spectacular pictures. Okay, this slide is of the August 2017 eclipse. Uh, you can see where the moon is just partially, a little bit partially blotting out the sun there. As you can see down here, we had, we had, we did have some clouds that day that were interfering with the, with, with the, the, uh, the event. These are, by, by the way, these are unprocessed images. I did not do any post-processing on these. These are straight out of the camera. And I wanted to show these to you this way. And again, these were taken with a Nikon bridge camera, not with an SLR. You'll get much better results with an SLR. But these were, these were my very first partial eclipse, solar eclipse photos that I've ever taken with any kind of camera. And which, at the time I had that, as I said, I had the Nikon P610. And uh, it didn't have auto bracketing, it didn't have any of that stuff. I used, I had to, expo I had to compensate my exposures by hand. It didn't have any of, any of the automatic features that you find on most SLRs nowadays. It was a very basic camera. So you can see that this image is a little bit overexposed. Actually, it's a lot overexposed. This, one's, this one looks a little bit better. Uh, the other factor to consider here too is that on that particular day I was photographing through clouds. There were scattered cumulus clouds floating about in the sky. The whole sky was just full of them. And you had to get breaks in between the clouds to, to get the sun uh, properly exposed. This is a little bit better exposed. You can see the sunspot groups there. And this was taken with the lens zoomed out a little bit. All these images appear different sizes because I was using different zoom settings on the camera. To optimize the uh, to optimize the exposure, and uh, uh, so that's why they appear to be slightly different sizes when you look at them. Now this is what we saw in 2017. This was this was the maximum eclipse point that we saw here in Cleveland. 
okay? Looks like a big frown. <laughs> uh, but this is what we saw from Cleveland. Had you been in, say, Carbondale, Illinois, or St. Louis, Missouri, or areas southwest of there in Arkansas, you would have seen a total eclipse. Pardon me? For about two minutes. Yeah, for about two minutes. That, that, eclipse, that eclipse was a very short eclipse. Yeah. Well, in any case, this is just about past the uh, maximum. And this is what you'll see on April 8th of next year. This is not my image. This is a NASA image. But this is the corona here, this outer... That's the corona of the sun. This is the part you want to make sure you get properly exposed. And you want to have plenty, as I said, you want to have plenty of dark space surrounding it. So you get it nicely framed. And it's going to take a lot of work to do that, but it's worth it. But once you get the hang of it, that's the reason why, you know, when you get out there, you want to get out there early and, and take some test shots of the sun you can, so you can practice. And if possible, obtain your solar filters well in advance because there's going to be a run on this stuff as we get closer to April. And a lot of these places are going to be sold out of stuff. If you're going to go out of town, you want to make sure you make your motel accommodations and your reservations now about this time because, as I said, this is going to be a very, this path of totality is going to be very, very narrow. It's going to be a narrow strip. It's going to run up the center, of the, the center of the country. And a lot of places are going to be booked solid with motel arrangements and stuff like that. So make your reservations early. If you plan on staying here in Cleveland, you take a chance with the weather. But we're going to stay put. We're not going to travel for this one either. Uh, we'll, probably, we'll probably live to regret that decision. But, <laughs> but <laughs> it is what it is. No, you don't, there's no prediction of the weather. Uh, I know people that went to go see the last total solar eclipse. They went to Carbondale, Illinois back in 2017. And it was clearer all the way up until the eclipse and then clouds moved in and spoiled the view. So you don't have to live in Cleveland or lake effect areas, uh, clo areas close to the lake to have clouds come in and spoil the view. It's just a, it's just a chance you take. You're always at the mercy of the elements. I know because I was an amateur astronomer for 50 years and I finally gave it up last summer because I got sick and tired of fighting the weather constantly, especially here in Ohio. This is not an area that's known for, for good, good astronomy skies. In any case, that's what you'll see. This is the beginning of the egress of the sun moving off the solar disk. A couple of sunspot groups visible right there. And you're not going to get the sunspots really sharp. The reason why that's going to happen like that is because during the daytime, the sun heats the atmosphere, and you've got atmospheric turbulence. And that wreaks havoc with solar images. The best time to take a picture of the sun is actually early in the morning when the sun is, after the sun has risen, just has begun to rise, uh, because the atmosphere is not yet stirred up. During midday, like when this eclipse happened, the atmosphere was already heated up and stirred up and everything else, and you know there were convective currents coming off of everything, sidewalks, buildings, uh, you know, what have you, structures all around the, around the areas, the streets and whatnot. So that interferes with getting really super sharp sunspot photos. So if, you're, if you really want to go after sunspots, take your pictures early in the morning. When it's before the atmosphere is stirred up. Again, more egress of the solar disk. There's a sunspot right there. And right there. This one's a little sharper. These sunspots stand out a little bit sharper here. This image was very much overexposed, uh, and uh, you can barely, you can just barely make out 
the two sunspot groups over here near the limb of the sun. And as you can see that day, we did have clouds. Uh, that was the final, that was the last contact the moon had with the sun that particular day. Uh, and uh, after that, the sun came back and appeared normal again, appeared out of the mouth of the dragon. <laughs> so uh, that's what you'll get if you're, if you're after sunspots that's not the best picture in the world. It looks a lot sharper on my computer monitor at home than it does on the projector here, but I don't know what the side projectors are showing, but it looks a little bit sharper from here. But uh, in any case, that's typically what you're gonna get with the commercially available white light solar filters that are on the market nowadays. So you'll get enough to be able to make out individual sunspot groups but you're not going to make out real tremendous amounts of detail in the sunspots themselves because you're not using high magnification. For that, you need a telescope. And even a telescope is going to be problematic because, as I said, the atmosphere gets stirred up during the daytime. And the best time to go out and photograph the sun if you're after sunspots is, as I said, early in the morning, after the sun has risen, just, just risen in the morning. Sources for safe solar filters. The one I like to use, and the one that I, the, the one that I've been using for the last, oh gosh, just over 40 years, is Thousand Oaks Optical. They make the solar light filters. They come in threaded, camera filter style form, or the slip fit form that I talked about earlier, that slip over your camera lens. Uh, what you need to do is you need to measure the outside diameter of your camera lens at the widest point. Okay, if you're gonna if you're gonna use the lens shade, measure measure the outside diameter of the lens shade. If you're gonna leave the lens shade off, measure the diameter of the lens proper, the outside diameter of the lens proper. And you go on their website and they will have various a sizing chart that you can use for your particular diameter in millimeters. It'll always be in millimeters. So we're gonna be metric here. Uh, and that website is thousandoaksoptical.com. It gives you a yellow-orange solar image, which is what I like because it gives, it seems to yield the best contrast uh, between the sunspots and the solar disk. Uh, the second source I would recommend would be would be Bader, 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 I think it's pronounced Bader, uh, solar filters, Astro Solar Safety Film, Photographic density, they make two different densities. They make a visual density, which is strictly for visual use, and they make a photographic density for if you're photographing the sun and various solar <coughs> events. And that can be had at astrosolar.com. I think uh, a company called Astrophysics is one of the, exclu is the exclusive distributor, and they're out of Illinois. I think they are the exclusive distributor for Bader in this part of the country, in this geographic part of the country. Uh, a third source is uh, Seymour Solar. They make something called black polymer, which gives an orange solar image. Um, it's not quite as good, it's an older technology than the solar light that Thousand Oaks makes, that sells. Thousand Oaks patented this solar light material. It's optically flat, uh, whereas the black polymer is not. But it's also cheaper to obtain and cheaper to make. That's what these, the solar filter material in these uh, eclipse glasses is made out of, is black polymer. And if you're used to obtaining stuff online, uh, you can get it from any one of these sources. Uh, but for a universal white, lines, white, white light lens solar filter, I would highly recommend daystarfilters.com. You can get those exclusively through B&H Photo. They're a distributor for Daystar filters. And what they are is they have a filter on them and they can have a cardboard cell around them that you adjust to fit your particular size camera lens. So that's why they're universal. They run about, uh, I don't know, between 20 and 25 bucks. So they're not real expensive. 
And for lens rentals, uh, I actually have another, I have, oh, there it is right there. Okay, I, I, did, I did include it. Uh, LensRentals.com, Nikon, Canon, and Sony. You can, you can rent a lens from them if you don't have a longer lens. Or BorrowLenses.com. I've done business with BorrowLenses.com before, and they're very good. They will ship to you, free of charge, UPS two-day shipping. You use the light, you get the lens, you, you go on their website, order it, they ship it to you, you pay the rental fee for whatever that lens is. It varies from lens to lens. And they will send you the lens, and then when you're done, after a predetermined amount of time, you package the lens up in the box that they sent you, along with the return shipping label that they give you, and send it back to them. So if you don't have a long lens, that's another good source. And you want to remember to rent early due to large demand if you're going to go that route. Because everybody in their mother is going to be wanting to going to be wanting a long lens for this thing. And these places are probably going to not going to have too much in the way of long long lenses left if you the closer you get to the eclipse. So I would recommend probably renting about maybe 30 to 45 days out in advance. And then you can return it the day after the eclipse, put it back in the mail, or put it back into UPS and send it back to them because you'll be done with it. And they do offer, I know Lens Rentals offers a uh, option to buy the lens after you're done renting it. And they'll take off like seven days worth of rental fee off the price of your lens if you, if you decide to buy the lens. Borrow Lenses does not do that. You have to send them back, you have to send them back the lens first and then tell them you want to buy it, and then they'll send it back to you, and then you pay the normal price, their, their asking price for the lens. So it's actually not quite as economical uh, as doing it from lens rentals. Lens rentals, I believe, is based out of Nashville, Tennessee. Borrow lenses, I believe, is based out of San Francisco, California. But they can get you stuff across country here in two days by UPS Second Day Air. Another good source for photographic neutral density filters and day star filters is B&H Photo. Adorama, I don't know if they carry if they carry day star filters or not. I didn't see them on their website. I tried looking for them, but I couldn't see any indication that they carried them. They do carry photographic neutral density filters, however. So that's a good source to get them, or your local camera store. And now that you have all these pictures of the sun, eclipse sun, what are you going to do with them? Well, you want to make a nice collage or something, you, something to display to your family and your friends, and you know that you that you accomplished photographing this. This is just one example that my wife Barb put together of a lunar eclipse that I took back in October of twenty of two thousand four. This is me in the center here with my telescope that I was using at the time, and she took each phase of the eclipse, starting with the full moon and the partial phase down to totality and then the partial egress. You could Something like this, you could have the total eclipse in the center of the frame, and then you can do the partial phases around the outside. That was done through the Photoshop. And every time I went to save a picture after fixing it, it froze. <laughs> the so computer froze. He found out about this <laughs> present coming to him when he heard <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's just one, just one, just one example of how you can display these photos when you're done taking them. Um, that's about all I have. Do you have any questions? Oh, hey, any great, questions? Kent. Like before you questions, let me turn the lights okay. on and let me use the mic so the people at home could hear. Yeah. Wait, you had one thing to say? Yes. Here. Being I related, I'd like to remind anybody who has never looked at the sun before or looked at a photo eclipse, do not look at the sun with your eyes without being covered. Your, your eyes have no pain receptors in them. You will do the damage before you even know it's done. Mm -hmm. The sun, sun will be there and then in the evening it'll, things will start fading. So never take any chance with your eyes. That's even worse than 
the cameras can be replaced if you yeah. fry a camera. Your eyes will never be replaced. Good advice. We had a question back here. Yeah. Wait, we'll pass it to you so people at home could hear. Hi, thank you. Does it matter if you're like with your street lights and all that kind of stuff? No, because you're going to be photographing this during the daytime, so street lights will not have any impact on your on your your photography. Uh, one thing that one thing that you will notice though during totality is uh, the one thing that we noticed when we we're photographing the maximum part of the partial eclipse is uh, it got darker, it got noticeably dimmer outside, and a little breeze picked up, and it got a little cooler. It dropped the temperature dropped about five or ten degrees, so the temperature will drop. It will get dark enough that you could see the brighter stars and the brighter constellations, the brighter stars in the in the constellations that happen to be visible that time of the year. And you may hear the birds stop chirping. Um, people may stop in their tracks in their cars and get on looking, look and wonder what the hell's going on, or, or, or am I losing my mind, or whatever. And if they don't know what this this is happening, but this is this is such a well publicized event that I can't see unless you're living in a cave someplace on Timbuktu or whatever that you're not going to know about this. A uh, question about the the cost of the Thousand Oaks filter. Yeah. Um, what would you expect? Well, a lot of that's going to depend on the size of your camera lens. I think they typically run anywhere from about forty between forty and eighty bucks. Okay. Just and that comes get... mounted in a metal cell. The filter comes pre-mounted in a metal cell that you just slip on. They give you some felt to put around the inside of the uh, the cell to help make it a uh, snug fit. You want to make sure that the filter is on to the extent that if you hold the camera with the lens pointing down that the filter doesn't fall off. Right. So if, if, if a breeze comes by and blows, you don't want the filter to get blown off and then ruin your camera. Okay, I just try to get it a ballpark figure. I, I'd hate to go out and spend 300 bucks and then have it be a rainy day or something. So. No, okay. camera filters don't typically run that much. Any other questions? Yes. During the partial eclipse, you probably don't have to worry about shutter speed, but when you have the total eclipse, what kind of, do you have to worry about a maximum shutter speed as far as for blurring the image, similar to like taking pictures of stars, getting short pictures like that? Yes. Uh, typically it is, whatever lens you're using, it is the reciprocal of the focal length of the lens that you're using. So if you're using a 200 millimeter lens, uh, I think it'll be something like, um, 200th of a second or something that effect uh, that's before you see any blurring of anything because you're not going to be using a tracking mount now if you've got a tracking telescope mount that you can mount your camera on by all means use it they do make dedicated sky trackers that will track the sun in, that will tr track the sun at the solar rate and the moon and the stars at, at their respective rates uh, they're a little pricey they're about 500 bucks give or take but if you have one, by all means, employ it. Use it. Or if you have an astronomer as a friend. Yeah. Any idea how far away from the lake you should be to have a reasonable chance of avoiding <laughs> or minimize? How far away from Lake Erie? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I know you don't want to be northeast of Cleveland because that gets lake effect up there big time that time of the year. We live in Medina and we don't get that much lake effect snow per se except if the winds are coming straight out of the north at real, at real brisk rate across the lake. Uh, lake effect clouds we do get. Uh, the farther away you can get from Lake Erie the better off you will be. The farther away you can get. So if you can get Someplace further south and west on that line, that totality line, the better the better your chances will be of actually seeing this thing and photographing it in its entirety. And as I said, if you're going to go out of state, make your reservations now because things places are going to get crowded. I mean, the last eclipse, people were lining the streets for hundreds of miles to to look at this thing 
and uh, we just were out in our front in our front yard, so we didn't have to worry about making any motel accommodations or anything. But but get as far away as you can from the lake. Yeah. Any other question? Yep. Another question. Yeah, to set your focus, you put on your solar filter and focus on the sun manually? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I, oh, one in the back here. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, the examples that you have were for shooting the eclipse where the sun is it taking up the majority of the frame, like really focusing in on that as your subject. Do you have any, you know, recommendations or how does your advice change? Um, is it even worth like finding a spot and figuring out where the sun is going to be in the sky at the time of the eclipse and getting a shot where it's the landscape and the sun as it's approaching totality? You mean getting the landscape and with the sun as it's approaching totality? Yes. I've never done that, okay. so I really can't answer that question. I've only focused on the sun proper. Okay, fair enough. Uh, it, it would make a nice picture. <laughs> uh, it does, it, no, they've seen them in sky and telescope. People have photographed uh, solar eclipses from, from various uh, mountainous locations and places that had famous landmarks in them, and uh, they showed the eclipse sun. Now, as far as a lens is concerned, if you want to do that, you want to use a wider angle lens, which means you're going to get a smaller solar disk image You'll still see the sun eclipsed, but it's going to be a considerably smaller image than I showed of the 200 millimeter focal length one yeah. on the screen. Uh, but it does make a spectacular sight, getting something in context with the something terrestrial in context with with the uh, eclipsed sun. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other any other questions? Yes. I was just going to say. I'm wait, wait, wait. I'm looking on the Th Thousand Oaks optical website. Okay, um, the uh, the threaded filters go anywhere between forty nine and seventy nine dollars. Seventy nine dollars for a ninety five millimeter. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's very reasonable yeah. compared to what we're seeing online. Yeah. Is there other? I think you could fool with the time. I was going to ask about auto ISO. You were saying the ideal speed is like a hundred, one hundred. Let's say you pick uh, one two hundredth of a second, mm -hmm. and f eight is your your opening there too, mm -hmm. and the variable variable you're going to have is that more and more of the sun gets covered, the amount of light you'll need right. is if a cloud comes over, but if you're on manual with auto ISO, then you'll stay at a two hundredth of a second, f eight, and as those clouds come over or whatnot, it should be just adjusting that from two hundred, you know. Up yeah. there, that that would be another um, just consideration. There's probably a yeah. lot of ways you could do that. That's what I was doing with the bridge camera that I used at the time to photograph the one in 2017. That's why some of the pictures appear a little bit brighter than others. I was constantly adjusting the ISO manually on that camera. In other words, I had to go on the menu and go to the ISO setting and turn a lever or pr press a button. Whereas with the cameras we have now, we have a dedicated ISO button. You press the button and turn a little command dial and you can adjust it on the fly. So it's it's a lot easier to do with cameras now than it was say say eight or ten years ago when I when I photographed this one. And that was as I said that was just with a basic bridge camera. And if you don't know what a bridge camera is, I am sure most most of you probably know what a bridge camera is, right? Okay, a bridge camera essentially is is a is a bridge camera it bridges the gap between a point and shoot and an SLR. It allows you to use it as a point and shoot, but it also allows you to adjust ISO, aperture, and uh, shutter speed via manual settings on the camera. And you can use it both in manual and automatic modes. So that's what a bridge camera is. And it doesn't have a detachable lens. It has a built-in lens that zooms. I think there's one on the market now that zooms like 125 times or something like that. I don't know, some ridiculous. I think it's a Nikon P1000, some big, huge zoom zoom on it that, that really works really well. Um, and uh, the problem with those cameras, though, is that after a certain period of time, the motors that move the lens in and out have a tendency to fail. So. 
I hadn't encountered that myself with our with the bridge cameras we were using because we didn't have them long enough to have to have that happen. But I know one person here had a bridge camera that they had to go out and buy a new bridge camera. They bought a, a P1 Nikon Coolpix P1000. They had a P610 because they're eventually they're, the motor that moves the lens in and out of their camera failed and they couldn't zoom their camera anymore. So they had to go out and buy a new one. But that probably is something that happens probably after about 10 years of use, I would imagine. It depends on how much you zoom in and out, how much you use the motor to zoom, zoom the lens in and out. Good. Any other, any other questions? I think yes. Wait. Not, not, just this, not just the solar eclipse, but sometimes you see um, the events such as the transit of the planets, uh, Venus and mm -hmm. Mercury. So it's not exactly just a one yeah. shot by. You can see other things. You can use too. it for planetary transit, Mercury yes. and Venus transits. Yes. yes. So in other words, if you spend the forty to eighty dollars on it, it's not a one time yeah. use. You could actually do it for other things or if you want to photograph just photograph a solar disk to take a picture of the sun with sunspots you're not just blowing 40 or 80 bucks on a, on a one-time deal uh, and uh, you can use it repeatedly it they require a minimum amount of care you want to you want to make sure you store them in a in dry cool dry place uh, the actual film that they use on these solar filters is pretty tough compared to what it was 50 years ago when they used aluminized mylar which is paper, is real thin stuff, and you could easily get pinholes in it. This stuff that they use today doesn't have that problem. So, because back in those days, if you develop pinholes, you had to take a black magic marker and go over the pinhole with it, with a black magic marker, and if the, it was, the hole was big enough, you had to throw the filter out and get a new one. These filters today don't have that problem. So they're very, very durable. They last you well beyond what you're, what you're going to be using it for, and, and they don't cost a whole lot. Great. Any other questions? Yep. Just curious. Um, the filter you're talking about. Is there any point to using that with either sunrise or sunset photography? Well, it depends on what point at sunrise or sunset that you're at. Um, I would say probably anything on either side of an hour after sunrise or before sunset, you'd want to use a filter. Simply because you don't want to damage your camera sensor. I think somebody did a, I think I remember reading on when I was doing my research for this presentation, I read a thing online where somebody actually took an old Canon camera, a uh, digital camera that was no longer uh, behaving properly. And just to prove a point, he pointed it at the sun without any filter on it, and the filter fried the camera within a minute, or the, the sun fried the camera within a minute. That's what will happen to your eyes if you look at the sun. And you won't tell because there are no, like, like she said, there's no pain receptors in your eyes. So don't risk it. Great. Any other questions? Yep. presentation I went to um, at ILR, Learning and Retirement Program, Baldwin Wallace, the lady talked about the reflections also. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, if, you, uh, if you're near a tree and you happen to see, if you're, if you're near like a large maple or oak tree or any tree that has regular leaves on it, you will actually see little images projected through those leaves on the ground of the eclipse sun. It acts like a pinhole camera. And you'll want to take note, if you can, if you're not photographing, if you're just watching the eclipse, you'll want to, you'll want to take note of the environment, what happens in the environment around you. Uh, I know in our case, we had people come by our apartment saying, what the hell's going on? What, is this the end of the world or something? And I said, no, it's a solar eclipse. And I gave them a pair of sunglass, uh, eclipse glasses to look at the sun. They didn't know. They actually didn't know this was going to happen after, despite it was being being a, it being publicized for months in advance. This is going to be even bigger because from here it's going to be a total, and we haven't seen a total here. I think I think the last total eclipse we saw here was back in the 1960s or 70s, early 1970s. There was one that hit the, that was in the continental United States in 1979, but it favored the Pacific Northwest only. And I watched that one on TV. Oh. 
Any other questions? This is going like, thank you very much, Ken. Okay, this was a, yeah. Thank you. Yep, this is, this is great. Uh, if there are any more, as we, I, I'm sure we'll be tapping you again as we get closer okay. to refresh us too. So we have till sure. April of next year. Sure. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Ken. Okay. Thank you, Richard.